So uh, we got a lot to cover today. Uh, this is the, one of the last sections in the chapter. And what I wanted to do really quickly is talk about choosing a solvent. I'll talk about what they talk about here, and then I'll talk a little bit more detail, stuff that's not in the book that you really just kind of need to know. Okay, so this topic is really narrow in the textbook. And what they're talking about is how to choose an appropriate solvent for an acid-base reaction. Okay? So let me make a little note here. I'm make a whiteboard, actually. I'm going to make a chalkboard, actually. I like the chalkboards better. And we're going to talk about a generic acid-base reaction. So I have... Sorry, I'm getting myself going here. HA plus... Uh, base goes to HB plus plus A minus. So that's a generic acid base reaction. And what's the solvent up till now? What's the solvent? Water. Yeah, it's been water all this time, right? We've been like all of general chemistry was like, oh, it's in water. So this is aqueous. And so in an acid-base reaction, when you have water as the solvent, there's also other reactions to consider. Okay. I could have HA plus water. And that makes hydronium an A minus. So far, so good? OK. Now, anybody like off the top of their head like know what the molarity of water is in water? No. The molarity. The molarity. Hey, bud. Uh-oh. I do, too. Or it won't let me watch anything. Mm. Well, no, it's a little Dr. King. <laughs> yes, it's mini-me. Well, why don't you sit right there, Andrew, and uh, see if it reconnects. Try again, okay? All right, so um, we have this reaction, and the, we, with water, the molarity of water in water is like 55 and a half molar. Yeah. Are you sure? <laughs> no. You better check. That's the smallest of the me's. He's the miniest of the me. So, huh? No, that's Andrew's the miniest. Oh yeah, he's only six. He had the stomach. He had some. He was sick yesterday. He had a stomach thing, but he had a fever yesterday. We decided, well, I'll bring him, and then my wife will take him home. So. She should be done with class now, but I think she just got dragged off into another conversation. All right, so um, let's see. Where was he at? 55 molar, yes. So I'm adding an acid to a reaction, and this is the reaction I want to happen, okay? But there's a lot of this water present. And typically what happens when you put an acid in water is if the acid is strong enough to protonate the water, then this is the only reaction that you see. Okay? It depends on the strength of the acid, this water as a base and whatever this other base is. The pKa for hydronium, approximately for H3O plus, is something like minus 1.7 or so. So it's a pretty strong acid, okay? So when you put the acid in water, you're gonna protonate the water, um, and if this base is not strong enough to pick up these protons, this is all that's gonna happen in the water, okay? So going back to the slide, This is known as the leveling effect. And that, by the way, is not the best explanation I've ever given of the leveling effect. I got a little distracted. 
called the leveling effect. The strongest acid that you can have in water is hydronium. Because anytime you put anything stronger than hydronium in water as an acid, all it does, because the molarity of the water is so high, is it just takes all the protons. Okay? And all you're left with is hydronium and the conjugate base of whatever that acid is. So if you're trying to do an acid-base reaction that requires that you put a proton on something other than hydronium, you should probably not do it in water. Okay. Especially if the acid that you're the thing that you're trying to protonate makes a conjugate acid that's stronger than hydronium. Okay. So turns out there's another at the, so at one end of the leveling effect you can't have an acid that's stronger than hydronium because that's all you'll get if you put an acid stronger than hydromium, hydronium in water. And on the other end, you can't have bases stronger than hydroxide. So the pKa of water is about 15.7 or something like that. So pK acid is a wa uh, water as an acid is around 15.7. So if the pKa of the base that you're put, putting in water, if the, its conjugate acid is higher than 15.7, right? When you put the base in water, because the molarity of the water is so high, all the water does is strip the protons off the water, and you're just left with hydroxide in the water. So that defines, it turns out, that defines the range of pHs that you can have in water, right? This is these pKa's for hydronium and for water. So that's called leveling effect. Yeah, let's see. So would water be an appropriate solvent for this? So we have, uh, I want to do, this is the reaction I want to do. I want to pr protonate Cl minus. Right? And if I remember right, pKa sulfuric acids around minus 9. And pKa of HCl is minus, you know, seven. Yeah, good job. So, definitely, if you think about acid-base reactions, right? This is a strong enough acid that it could protonate that. It's stronger by a hundred times stronger than HCl. Yeah. But if you did this in water, all that either that e that acid would do is protonate the water that's there, right? And none of this would get formed in the reaction. Just because if you did in water, it, yeah, the, the sulfuric acid would just protonate the water. Uh, OK, so yeah, so what's the equilibrium constant? I'm going to um, use round numbers. Let's say, the, let's say approximately, OK, the pKa of hydronium is minus 2. I already said it's not minus 2, but let's just pretend it's minus 2. The pKa of sulfuric acid is minus 9. So there's seven orders of magnitude difference, right? So the equilibrium constant is about 10 to the 7th in favor of protonating water versus uh, protonating the chloride, OK? So just take the, the uh, pKa's, subtract them. That tells you what the equilibrium, the power of the equilibrium constant is. OK. So bases stronger than OH cannot be used for water. So if you look at this reaction, for example, right? if I wanted to run this reaction, now amide has ammonia, uh, amines have pKa's of around, do you guys remember? It's a large number, right? It's 35. And for acetylide ions, it's around 25. So if you just look at the reaction, you can say to yourself, the acid on the left, right, and the acid on the right, the acid on the left is about 10 orders of magnitude stronger. The equilibrium constant should be really in favor of the right-hand side, right? But if you put this in water, because the pKa of water is like 15.7, right, all that's going to happen when you put these together is this is going to, uh, sorry, this really responding slowly, sorry. This is going to strip the proton 
off the water, and all you'll have is hydroxide, and it won't be a strong enough base to remove the proton from this. Okay. So then what we do is we choose a solvent that won't lose its proton when you put it under those situations. So an alcohol, oops, down here, all right? PKs of alcohol and water, if you don't ever, if you don't remember, like, oh gosh, what's the PK of an alcohol? Usually the exact number is not that important. An alcohol looks a lot like water, right? So if you can remember what water is, you know the pKa of an alcohol. It's about the same, okay? Uh, there's going to be subtle differences because of the methyl groups and things like that. We'll talk about that in a little bit, but there'll be some subtle differences. Um, there's an ether, okay? And there's an alkane. So if you were doing this reaction, which do you think would be a better solvent of the three that are shown? Which one's the worst one? Which one can you not use? The far left. Can't use the far left, the alcohol. And then you said, you said I, I saw a finger go to the far right. Why not the far right? Well, the, this is it, organic. Right, so this would very easily dissolve in this, okay? But what about this? Right, that's an ion, right? Ions are not dissolved well in nonpolar materials. So what you need to have, think about the, in a chemical reaction, you know, one of the things we tell you in Chem 1B is for a reaction to take place, two reagents have to get together, right? That in like organic chemistry in practical terms, typically means they have to be in solution together. Otherwise, the reaction's really slow. So probably the best solvent for something like this is this. And the reason is because th this is polar and this is polar, right? But if you want to get this in solution so it reacts with this, the standard strategy is to use not an alkane, but to use something that has some polarity to it, but no hydrogens that can be pulled off. If you remember alkanes, the PKAs, you guys remember those? I know it's a Monday following a test, so like your brain is still reloading. But yeah, it's like 50. Yeah, hydrogens don't want to come off of those. They're like 50. And, and the ether, this hydrogen is the most acidic one, and it's probably between 40 and 50, okay? Because there's no resonance. It has an inductive effect because of the oxygen, but its PKA is going to be really Okay. Um, hmm. Yeah, I'll finish this and then I'll I'll do the, the there's the the next section in my head, uh, which is not in your book here. So I'll do that after this. If I do this. Okay. So solvation. What does solvation mean? Huh? Being dissolved. Yeah, solvation just means being dissolved. And like in a, in a solution, when you have an ionic compound, right, and an ionic compound dissolves, what happens to the ions? Separated. They get separated. Yeah, they split apart from each other. Why do they split apart from each other? Yeah, other, things, other things get in the way. So think about it like this. If I have sodium plus and chloride minus. The attraction between sodium plus and chloride minus is really strong. Okay? The only reason they split up when you put them in water is because when you put them in, well, there's two, re two things. There's entropy and enthalpy, right? Do you remember those terms? Let's just think about the enthalpy part, not the entropy part. What happens is the sodium ion splits apart from the chloride ion, and they both associate with water molecules. So like if you're a sodium ion and you have a positive charge, oxygens will take their electrons and stabilize the charge for the sodium. Typically, there's anywhere from uh, 8 to 25 water molecules surrounding and holding that sodium ion ap apart from the chloride. And then on the chloride's end, um, sorry, six, not eight. I don't know where eight came from. 
Anyways, long story. So then the chloride gets hydrogen bonded to by the water because it has these nice big fat lone pairs of a negative charge, right? And so this process, like in chemistry, that's the part we call solvation, where the solvent molecules interact with the ions that are formed and surround them or with the molecules that are dissolved, okay? So practically speaking, solvation is the dissolving process. But what we think about as chemists, we think about the polar interactions with the ions or the molecules that are dissolved in solution. So it turns out solvation is an important part of um, pKa's. They're not actually bonded, they're just up the other side. Yeah, electrostatics, yeah. Like op opposite charges attract each other, and then when they move close to each other, that stabilizes them. And there's so many water molecules in water, as we talked about earlier, that what ends up happening is they surround those ions, keep them from getting back together, and they're more stable in the end product than when they were when they were originally together. Um, yeah, anyways, thinking about all kinds of other things, too, about that. And if, if you look at these two alcohols, T-butyl alcohol and ethanol, right, and you think to yourself, oh, uh, they look the same. They're both alcohols. Remember I said they're like water, so the pKa is around 15. You know, this T-butanol's pKa in water is about 18, and ethanol is about 16, and water is about 15.7, okay? So of the two that are shown there, ethanol is actually a stronger acid. Now, what we, what we do when we talk about ARIO is we talk about the stability of the ion just from the perspective of structural features of the ion. But it turns out solvation also has an effect on how strong an acid is in a solvent. Okay. So based on what I said, right, solvation has to stabilize the anion that's formed. And the more it stabilizes the anion, the stronger the acid appears to be. Does that make sense, what I said? For, for the, the role of solvation in formation of ions is that it stabilizes the ions by surrounding them and stabilizing the charge that's formed. So that's independent of what we talk about in ARIO. Because okay? in ARIO, we're looking at what the atom of the molecule is, what the uh, resonance of the molecule is, what the inductive forces on the molecules are, and what are the orbitals on the molecule. But once the molecule actually forms, we also have to think about its interactions with the solvent or whatever medium it's happening in. Okay. So if you look at these two, T-butyl alcohol, the ion that it makes looks like that. And ethanol looks like that. So the question is, how is solvation right, affected by that small difference? Or what would we perceive as a small difference on paper? That is, the only difference is there's two methyl groups here that aren't over here. But they still have the oxygen and the oxygen here. And it turns out when you, when you look at how these molecules actually look in solution, the picture gets to be a little easier to understand. So for solvation to take place, right, the water molecules, if this is in water, have to be able to surround the ion. This is, unfortunately, they didn't draw these to scale. I don't know if you noticed, this one's a little bit smaller scale than this one is. But when the solvent molecules try to solvate the T-butoxide ion, they can only really approach it from the front. And the reason is, is because they have these methyl groups that are sort of around the sides that are sort of burying that charge, okay? So what we say is that T-butoxide is sterically hindered. Sterically hindered means the approach to the molecule or approach to part of the molecule is blocked by other parts of the molecule. Sterics, yeah. Yeah, so just, because remember, if the solvent wants to get over here and stabilize this, it has to get past these hydrogens, right? And so these hydrogens that are out here keep the solvent from efficiently packing in around the negative charge and stabilizing. 
On the other hand, in the ethoxide ion, it has some bulkiness over here. We call this, by the way, I don't think he has the word up there, but we say it all the time. We would say that uh, sterically hindered, or we also say this term bulky. Right. Bulky implies what? Like crowded and, yeah, do you guys remember a Christmas story? And the little kid, when he goes out in the snow, he was sterically hindered because he had that snowsuit on, and then he needed to do something. He had to go pee or something. I don't remember what it was. But he couldn't do it because he was too sterically hindered. He was very unstable that way. Okay. So this is the little guy in the snowsuit. That's what that's called. And then uh, this is, I guess, somebody else not in a snowsuit, has less clothes on, whatever you want to say. But he's not easily solvated by the solvent. Uh, some really dramatic examples happen when you look at water versus other solvents. Uh, one of my favorite solvents is this one down here. It's called acetonitrile. Do you have the name up there anywhere? This is acetonitrile. Aceto, like an acetic acid, means two carbons. A nitrile is a C triple bonded to an N. And the structure for acetonitrile is like this. Okay, so really quickly, let's talk about acetonitrile in terms of its like structure and what its properties might be. Polar or nonpolar? Polar. Polar. Why polar? Because different atoms bonded together. So that's definitely polar. Um, it's got a little bit of organic character to it. That is, it's got the carbon-carbon bonds and the hydrogens bonded to the carbon, but it does have a polar group on it. Where are the dipoles? What's, what are the charges? Where would I put the partial charges? The nitrogen would be partial negative, and the carbon would be partial positive. And so the dipole goes like this. Okay. So remember, when we're talking about solvation, we're talking about acid base strength. We have to talk about the solvation of the anion that's formed, right? Which charge stabilizes the anion? That partial positive on acetonitrile. Notice where it's located. It's in the middle of the molecule. So in this case, you know, if you think about water in comparison to water, roughly drawn like this, water is not sterically hindered at all. Very small, very polar, has a good capability of either the positive or negative interacting with the anions that are formed in solution, right? Acetonitrile is a sterically hindered solvent. That is, where the positive charge is for stabilizing the anion is buried inside the middle of the molecule, and when it tries to stabilize the anion, it can't, just because its charge that it would use is in the middle of the molecule rather than out on the ends of the molecule like the hydrogens are out here. Okay, so this, so this is, having said all that, look at the pKa's for acetic acid in water. It's 4.75, and hopefully that's all like you all have a tattoo of that or memorize that. Um, sorry. You don't have to have a tattoo. It has to be for good. If you get a tattoo, I always tell people, it has to be for a good reason. A long-lasting reason. Girlfriends not included. Sorry. Well, that's my sons are that age, and I sometimes wonder, I wonder if they're going to get you. All right. So <laughs> this is all being recorded. I'll have them listen to it later. So... <laughs> And then in acetonitrile, it's 23.5. Okay, so which one's stronger? Is acetic acid in water or acetic acid in acetonitrile? In the water. By 20 orders of magnitude. That's the difference of the solvent's ability to solvate the anion and change the acid or base strength of something. Okay. So, yeah, it's very cool. It's kind of nerd cool, though. If you really like that, then maybe something's wrong with you. Now, one other thing. <laughs> Go ahead. I've never something like that before. Does that mean that if you want to create something that's a lower or higher pH than 0.14, you have to 
use a different solvent. Yeah. Really, really, really acidic. So you could use an ether, or you can use like you want to go to really high pHs, you can use something like an ether. If you want to go to really low pHs, uh, what would you use? You could, there's a bunch of things you could use. I won't get into it later, but yeah, there's a bunch of stuff you can't. Oh yeah, there's a lot of stuff that you can use. Yeah. And sometimes they play tricks. Like if you can't get an ion to go into solution, what they do is they produce a solution that has um, the ability to wrap itself around another ion and drag it into the organic phase. They have all kinds of funny things that they, yeah. All kinds of funny things you could do, be, have imagination and think about. Anyways, next. Last note on this, and I'm gonna go to a little side topic. Counter ions, spectator ions, pretty much can ignore them. Can't always ignore them, okay? So for example, um, in this reaction, right, when we write this out, what we're really thinking of is when we're, as organic chemists, we typically write this out instead, and we ignore the fact that there's sodium ions in there. But not all sodium ions, not all cations are the same. Like sodium requires a very polar solvent, but there's a lot of other kind of ions that we can use to help increase the solubility and increase the reactivity of something. Um, for example, common cations would be things like, well, not that, would be things like this. Ooh, that's horrible. Well, it's not exactly right, huh, but... Gets your point across. Yeah. I turned, this one's turned differently, right? Yeah, there's no good way to do that, I suppose. But this is tetraethyl ammonium ion. It's a lot more organic and nonpolar than a, a, a sodium ion would be. And so it can dissolve in a lot of organic solvents that sodium ion can't. So you can change the ion that you use, uh, the counter ion that you use. So even though we don't write it, it's important to know that it can have an effect on the reaction. Okay, um, so let me, let me uh, stop here, and I'm going to take a little side journey uh, and talk. I would partially turn on the lights if I could, but I don't think I can. You want to hit that button in the back that turns the overhead light on, the little can lights up here? I don't know what button you mean. Push it. No? Yes. yes. Oh. The one that's round and pushy looking. <laughs> Okay, so let's say you have a beaker. And you put in this molecule. That's known as benzoic acid. So we put benzoic acid in that beaker, and this is kind of a trick question. Does it dissolve or does it not dissolve? What's in the beaker? Ah, that's the answer. The answer is what's in the beaker, right? So <laughs> if the beaker contains water, okay, turns out that doesn't dissolve. Benzoic acid is not very soluble in water. Even though it has this carboxylic acid group on it and is partially polar, the rest of this, there's enough nonpolar character to it that it doesn't actually dissolve. And you know that, that saying that we used in Chem um, 1A, like dissolves like, or Chem 1B, like dissolves like, this is just not enough like water. Like this part's just like water, but then the rest of it's not. On the other hand, so this one is non, benzoic acid has uh, got a mixture of nonpolar and some polar, but not enough to allow it to dissolve in water. You can get it to dissolve in water, 
if you mix in sodium hydroxide. And then, because this is organic chemistry, I'm going to get out my eraser and get rid of that. Not that it's not important, but I end up with OH minus. So, so if I actually had water and benzoic acid, I try to mix them together, all I would end up with is this wet lump of solid, right, floating around in the beaker. Now, if I had sodium hydroxide to it, it does go into solution. But what does the sodium hydroxide do to the benzoic acid? Yeah, it's a neutralization reaction. It's an acid-base reaction. So in the neutralization reaction, what I end up with is the benzoate ion. This is actually one of those things, if you look at food labels, you'll see benzoate. It's a preservative they use in foods. I'm not sure how it works. So this is benzoate. By the way, that naming convention is uh, the same as uh, that we use for Gen Chem. It ends in ick, so the conjugate base of it ends in eight. All right, ick goes to eight and ike goes to us. You remember those rules? Same rules apply. Okay, but this is soluble in water. Why? Because it's become ionic. It's even more charged, more polar. It's not really that it's just polar, but it's now ionic. And ionic things, right, are much more soluble in water. So if you can ionize it, okay, then you can take something that's, that's an acid and not soluble in water, and then all of a sudden it becomes soluble. This is uh, one of those questions, and you... Well, let, yeah, we did something like this in lab as a question. And then I realized, you know what, I better sit and talk about it because it's not actually, like, right in the book. So that's why I'm adding these slides. So let's rethink this problem. Um, I am going to do a little erasing. Are you recording this? Yeah. I don't want to erase everything. I want to leave my beaker. My eraser's too small. Makes me have to do too much work. Ah, there we go. Giant eraser. Okay, so now, got my beaker. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put in an amine. Uh, let's see. I'll do uh, CH3, CH2, CH2, CH2. H2, uh, NH2. Soluble or not soluble? Now we know the beaker has water in it, by the way. So. It's pretty much not soluble. Probably not soluble. Why not soluble? All those CH parts. Yeah, all of this organic part. And remember, benzoic acid, I didn't show them specifically, but there's actually seven carbons in benzoic acid. All right. The limit is about four, it turns out. Once you get to about four carbons, what are you guys doing? Sorry. Experiments. Um, you know, the TSS one to put carbons in here. We're seeing it a little bit. Oh, oh, okay. No, no problem. So uh, the limit's about four carbons. Once you get to four carbons, like if it's an alcohol or an amine, once you get to four carbons and higher usually, or maybe five carbons and higher, they're not soluble in water. And that's just because the nonpolar part begins to dominate over the polar part. And when we talk about like dissolves like, they're less like water uh, than they would be when they had fewer carbons. Okay? So if I wanted to get that dissolved in water, I could add hydrochloric acid to it. And then I'll end up with R, NH, proton transfer reaction, right? Three plus. 
And now that it's ionic, it's much more soluble in water. So where it wasn't soluble before, or very slightly soluble before, it'll go straight into solution once you've done that. Now there's a limit to, you know, like if it's a really gigantic molecule, maybe changing the pH doesn't help. It just stays insoluble. Okay. Next. These are all little things, these details, I realize that people don't, like, think about 6-molar NaOH or 3-molar. 3-molar is, the one I, is an often example I use. 6-molar NaOH. What is the major component of 6-molar sodium hydroxide? It's not sodium hydroxide, by the way. Of six molar sodium hydroxide. Water. It's water. It's about 80% water still. Okay? So we don't think about that, but six molar sodium hydroxide, I mean, because you guys don't have to actually make those solutions very often in the back. We get, like, for, for it always surprises me, like, when I make 10th molar sodium hydroxide, I'll make, like, liters of 10th molar sodium hydroxide. It's a small little pile of pellets they throw in all of that water. There's almost no, like in terms of percent by weight, very little sodium hydroxide in a 0.1 molar. Three molar sodium hydroxide is about 10%, six molar is about 20%. But still, the major component is water. So let's say, right, you have a beaker again. And in this beaker, I have an organic solvent. Now, what do I mean by organic solvent? I could mean an ether. I could be hexane. It could be anything that's mostly nonpolar is typically what we think of an organic solvent. I should say mostly nonpolar. And um, I dissolve, I put in some psych, uh, benzoic acid in there. Oops. I'll draw it over here. Because benzoic acid is mostly nonpolar, it goes right into the organic solvent. It dissolves straight in, okay? Uh, Ether, again, like we showed, did in that previous problem, ether is probably a good choice. It's the one they used in the problem that was in the book in the lab. Ether is probably a good choice because it has some polar character to it, and it's not really affected by acids or bases very much, at least at these concentrations. So what will happen is this will be dissolved or in solution, okay? And then what, I, what you can do is you can add sodium hydroxide to it. Now, the sodium hydroxide will probably go to the bottom because of the density. It's mostly water, and most, most aqueous solutions are more dense than more, most organic solvents. It's not always true, but I'm going to draw it on top because I don't want to have to redraw my beaker. <laughs> right. It'll probably switch places, though. Both would be clear, by the way. Both solutions are clear, and the way you tell that you have two, two liquid phases in there is you actually can see a meniscus that forms between the two. And because the index of refraction is different, you can see, like, the, the interface where they shine. It gets kind of shimmery looking. You can shine a laser on it. It actually reflects off. It's kind of cool. But. All right. So if I put in sodium hydroxide in here, Oops, N-A-O-O. -O. I was thinking I just forgot to put 6-molar here. 6-molar aqueous sodium hydroxide, right? What does the 6-molar aqueous sodium hydroxide do? Well, it doesn't go into the nonpolar solvent, so that's why you get the layers, because they're not alike, and so they don't dissolve. But what's going to happen to the benzoic acid? What's that? Yeah, at the interface where they make contact, right here, 
this reaction is going to be taking place. Uh, I didn't leave myself much room. I'll do it like that. That's going to take place. And because you have two phases of different polarity, what happens? The benzoate ion that's formed will move into the aqueous phase and leave the organic phase. So you can take like an acid or a base and you can remove it from the organic phase and separate it from other components that are either neutral or basic in this case. Okay. So if we could do this in an experiment, what group, is that when we would agitate it? And yeah, it yeah. So this would be really slow if you like poured it really slowly and then it just had to take place at the interface. So you would actually take this in a larger container, it's called a separatory funnel most likely, and you would shake them. And then you would set them aside and then wait for the, the meniscus to reform between the two and then drain the lower layer out. Okay. Or suck the lower layer out if you were doing it in a centrifuge tube. But a, a separatory funnel, let me see if we have them in here. I know we've been fiddling with them. I don't know where they went to. Let's see if I have my separatory funnels in here. You'll see how handy they are. I think they got moved to a more convenient location. Do you want me to grab one for you? Just one. I want to show them. Yeah, so a separatory funnel is designed for this kind of separation where it allows you to drain and separate two layers from each other without taking a pipette and going through one layer and sucking out the bottom layer, okay? Okay, so let's do a mixture. And it's going to have an acid, a base, and a neutral. And this is that problem, right? And they're all dissolved in an organic phase. So what I would do if I wanted to separate all these, oh yeah, here's a separatory funnel, all right? Very cool little piece of glass. And you, it has, it's like a burette, right? So if you leave that open and you fill it up, Right? I've seen students do this. I've done it myself. You start pouring stuff in it and you realize it's open because there's all this stuff leaking out the bottom. So you close it like that and you put the organic layer. So I would have this mixture of acid, base, and neutral in here. And then, and then it would be dissolved in an organic solvent, whatever the organic solvent is. And then I would add an aqueous either acid or base to this separatory funnel, put the cap on it, and then shake it. And you shake it like this, and then you, with, there's a cap that goes on it, you tilt it like this, and then the liquid runs down, and then you open this and you vent out any vapors that form, then you reclose it, and you shake it. And there's actually a funnel stand, you just stick this in the funnel stand, and you can leave it there and it separates the two. And then when you're ready to take the bottom layer out, you remove the stopper, you turn this thing, you remove the bottom layer, you close it, and you repeat. So, so what would happen in this experiment if I wanted to take the acidic component out first, I would do 6 molar NaOH, and then I would separate out the lower layer. So I make my arrow, this is called a flow chart. I separate out the lower layer, I take my arrow and I draw it down. And this is my aqueous layer, and this is my organic layer going that way. Now, when you do this experiment, it's not very likely that you get it all out in the first extraction. So you might do it two or three times or four times. The only thing that you're depending on is that when you put the sodium hydroxide in there, that the acid becomes more soluble in the aqueous layer than it was before, and you can start removing it from the original mixture. Okay. So over here, you have an aqueous layer. This is going to have the acid 
Let's see, what do I want to do? Let's call the acid uh, A minus, the conjugate base of the acid. And then you want to get that out. This is all aqueous. You just add 6 molar HCl or uh, NaOH. What, what did I say? Oh, HCl. Sorry, I got confused what I was doing here. And what, what happens when you do that, this will cause the precipitate, usually cause the precipitation of the solid. And the reason is because the, the organic acid was probably not soluble in water in the first place. And so when you reprotonate it, it becomes not soluble again. I got impatient the other day. I tried doing this demo in class the other day. I just got impatient. If you wait, so it took it just took a long time for it to happen, but it'll happen. Okay. Now, in my organic phase over here, what do I have? The acids get gone, right? Yeah, so I have the base and the neutral. This you might do three times, by the way. Like, this is actually the procedure you would follow if you were doing an experiment. You would just write it out like this and do the procedure like this. The neutral's not going to come out. So now what you do is you wash it. That's what we would say. You wash it with HCl or extract it with HCl. Again, six molar is a real common number. Three molar is a common number. It just depends on how much stuff you have to extract. And that'll cause there to be the formation of a HB plus layer. That part, the protonated base, right, becomes positively charged as it picks up the proton. And so now what you have is you have this charged conjugate acid of the base. What do you think you do next? If you want to get it, yeah, you add an acid, a base. You add a base to this, pull the proton off, and then usually it just precipitates out. Okay. And then what you're left with in this final box, so I'm going to just put a little arrow here, and you guys said what you're supposed to, over here, you just have the neutral left. And that neutral, you probably have to clean it up. You probably have to add a drying agent to it, right? You may have to, there may be some precipitates to form. It can get really messy. Um, but then at the end, you'll end up just evaporating the solvent. You may have to do chromatography on it. You may have to run it through a column. The column will trap all the ions and let the neutral go through. But there's a lot of things you could do. Yeah. Oh, because they're both aqueous at that point. And so if they're both aqueous layers, so remember, 6 molar HCl and 6 molar sodium hydroxide are predominantly water, right? And so when you're down at this stage here, you're taking the 6 molar HCl, and you collect that, usually the lower layer, right? That lower layer is an aqueous layer. So you're just going to add a base, in this case, to this one, sodium hydroxide, that's also aqueous. You don't get a separation of layers. But what does happen is because you make it neutral, the solubility goes way down, and it can precipitate out. If it doesn't precipitate out, then you may have to extract it into a clean organic solvent. <laughs> like you take another organic layer, you neutralize it, you get another organic ether layer that's clean, that doesn't have anything else in it. You put it in there, and you extract out the, the base from that weird mixture, and then you evaporate the organic solvent and then you're left with the solid at that point. So like I said, it can get really messy at the end. You may have to actually extract your final product out into another clean organic layer once you neutralize it, and then you evaporate the solvent. Go ahead. Well, if you think about sodium, 6 molar sodium hydroxide and 6 molar uh, HCl as aqueous extractions, those are the strongest acids and bases 
you can get in water because all they do is form hydronium and form hydroxide. So you're basically saying the six molar is just to take into account the fact that you might have a lot of material that you have to extract out. You, you can often do these things with three molar or one molar, but then you have larger volumes that you deal with because you need more stuff to do the extraction with. The pH range, the leveling effect, yeah. Yeah, so we're always looking at that, yeah. That makes sense? Leveling effect, just because it's an we're extracting with aqueous solutions, you can only get as strong an acid as hydronium and as strong a base as hydroxide. He was asking, could you use too strong of an acid or too strong of a base? And the answer is really no, because HCl, when you put it in water, is really just hydronium. And sodium hydroxide, when you put it in water, is, is just hydroxide. Yeah. If you put like a mite in there, a mite is much stronger base than hydroxide, it'll just react with water because it's aqueous to make hydroxide. So that again would be the strongest base that you could have. So it's not, uh, the, the good news about that is you don't have to be that careful. You don't have to think about which acid. Yeah, which acid am I going to use? Don't use nitric acid, I'll just tell you that. Nitric acid is an oxidizing acid. But yeah, use what they call inorganic or mineral acids like HCl, HBr. They don't react very often. Good? All right. Okay, so um, real quickly, Lewis acid base theory. I'm not going to say much about this. We'll probably cover more of it later. Lewis said, hey, I got an idea. Since Bronson and Lowry came up with this proton transfer thing, okay, I'm going to come up with electron donator and electron acceptor. Okay, so let me explain to you. We'll go back historically. Arrhenius, all right, he was the guy who decided to call acids things with H plus and bases things with OH minus. But then the Arrhenius definition was very limiting because it had to be something with H plus and something with OH minus. So Bronson and Lowry says, well, we don't have to make the definition that narrow. We could talk about proton transfer. So an acid is something that gives the proton, and the base is something that accepts the proton. And then Lewis said, well, we don't even have to be that restrictive. We could just talk about what the electrons do. A base donates electrons, and an acid accepts electrons. Okay, So if you look at this bottom reaction, this is a Bronsted-Lowry reaction. or Sorry, this is not a Bronsted-Lowry reaction. It's a Lewis definition of an acid and base. The lone pair of the electrons on the water donate to the boron trifluoride, and you get this, it's called this witter ion, it has two charges on it. Get this witter ion, right? This was the electron acceptor, this was the electron donor, so this is the acid, that's the base. Um, Old-fashioned acid-base reactions that you're familiar with still fall under this definition, so let me draw one for you real quick. Uh, okay. Let's say we're looking at um, an OH minus. and HCl. And then OH minus is going to attack the hydrogen, and that'll kick the electrons off like that. And I'll end up with HOH, water, and Cl minus. So I'm going to just put little bars like that for the charges like that. So remember, OH minus is the proton acceptor, right? If you look in this definition, it's taking the hydrogen from the HCl. So the proton acceptor, that's the base, right? It's also, the, in the same sense, using the arrow notation that we use in organic chemistry, it's also the electron donor. Okay? HCl right, is the proton donor, which is the acid, or in the Lewis definition, it's the electron acceptor, which is also the acid. So it turns out 
If it's Bronsted Lowry acid base, it still fits in the Lewis acid base theory, but there are lots of things in Lewis acid base theory, like this reaction that I just showed you on the previous slide, that don't fit Bronsted Lowry. So it's a much more general definition. Okay. I don't think it could get more general than that. Because we're down to it has electrons and gives them, or it has electron doesn't have electrons and accepts them. So I mean that's like the simplest, most not simplest, the most fundamental level that you can get to. Most of organic chemistry reactions and mechanisms are based on Lewis acid base theory. The way we draw the electrons moving through space, we're really doing Lewis acids and bases. We don't think about it that much that way, but that's what it really is. So remember we talked about nucleophiles and electrophiles. Let me write electrophile here. What is an electrophile? Something that attracted to the negative charge of the electron. Likes electrons, right? So it's the electron acceptor. So it's the Lewis acid and a nucleophile it's the electron donor it has a pair of electrons it likes the positive charge it's the Lewis base so oh, like I said earlier you know organic chemistry is all electrophiles and nucleophiles I said 90 percent 99 percent if you ask me but for what I do but we also it also falls under this Lewis acid base theory okay so that's it for that chapter. Let me stop that recording. I will um, 